There are so many voices in this country that are speaking up and active, people active in their communities, that I'm not talking about a fringe minority or a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the mainstream media. The media today represents a minority elite. These all have to be challenged, and many people are doing it. It's Michael Franti here. This is Amy Goodman with, with Rochester. Rochester Indie Media. Hi, you're watching Rochester Indie Media's Indie TV. I'm Dawn Supelli, the Barefoot Host. Check us out online, rochester.indiemedia.org. Today's show, we're going to be talking with Davey V, an independent filmmaker and citizen journalist who has also taken the Rochester Police Department to task on a lot of the abuses and brutality and who's experienced a lot of it himself and through his history in his family and in the community here. So we're going to learn more about that. Thanks, Dave, for being oh, out here. Davey. Thank you. Thank and, you for having uh, me. Let's just start with your experience as a video uh, documentarian, as a citizen journalist. How did you uh, get involved with that? Well, it's funny because this building brings, uh, where, we're, where we're filming this, uh, brings a lot of memories. My dad, Mario Vara, was a longtime uh, activist, community activist here in Rochester. And um, he was very, uh, you know, strong and, and, and against the fight, you know what I mean, against police brutality. And having come from Cuba in 68, uh, with my brother, who at the time was six years old, uh, he knew that in the police state, I mean, the cops could basically kick your door down and beat you down, and you really have no recourse. So for him to see this happen in a, in a, you know, in, in a in a free society like you know the U.S., um, it really um, you know shattered his hopes. You know what I mean? And he became really active, and I helped him a lot on uh, actually a Spanish show that he produced, hmm. and uh, he was the host of and helped produce. And um, I got my start kind of uh, after his death. I was really motivated. In 93, he passed away, and I was motivated really to get into it. And uh, with kind of different twists, more on, on a hip-hop type of style. What kind of programs did your dad do? Uh, he did a show called La Voz del Pueblo, which translates the the into the voice of the people, yes. the voice of the town. Yep, you got I'm it. working on it. Yep, very good. And um, exposing a lot of, uh, geared a little bit more towards the Spanish, non-English speaking community here in Rochester, uh, exposing everything from police abuse to discrimination and, and work and discrimination in the workplace to um, also uh, slumlords, mm -hmm. you know, which is something that, uh, that he was very uh, strong against too, you know, these people collecting these DSS checks and having uh, families live in the most dire, uh, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, uh, infested, you know, rat infested violations, uh, you know, that, that you could imagine. So you definitely got a lot of your social consciousness from your father. Oh, yeah. It sounds yeah. like from yeah. the type of work that he did. And he also experienced direct hand police brutality and then took the uh, police department for a civil case, right? Yeah. Was it I've had, uh, a retaliation to the work he was doing? Or was yeah, I mean, what the, the thing that's happened is uh, based uh, on, on a lot of his work and then where I kind of, where he kind of left off after his, uh, after his passing. And, uh, and I took on, you know, uh, the name, uh, you know, unfortunately the, the, the last name uh, rings some bells within certain, I'm not going to say all maybe, but a, a, a good amount of uh, officials, you know what I mean? And he was definitely, uh, what I said in his obituary basically is he was a thorn in the side of, of our elected officials, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and rightfully so. No, you know, these, uh, these officials that are paid to do their job uh, didn't appreciate, didn't like someone like my father basically at every town meeting and every... Uh, you know, session basically calling them out and demanding that they do their job, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, calling out the injustices. So uh, he he riled uh, mm -hmm. several big uh, big forces. And what were some of the circumstances, if you want to talk briefly about it, I don't know if you, if you wanted to today, but um, the circumstances around um, his civil suit against them. His civil suit was basically uh, based on a, on a unlawful entry into the home. And that was a case that was kind of at the... Uh, in the in the late 80s, uh, but the the stuff really really got bad on the part of the Rochester police. Unfortunately, after his passing, I was involved in um, in two in two lawsuits. Uh, one one what they say was mistaken identity in '89. I was basically beat up by members of the Goodman section. 
of the RPD back when it was different sections. Now it's kind of east and west sides. And, uh, but the most notable one, that one, uh, you know, the conclusion was positive. And so was uh, my second one. In, in 97, basically, um, I sued a Rochester police officer. He's now a sergeant, David Joseph. And if the name sounds familiar, Joseph is the brother yeah. of Nicholas Joseph, uh. who uh, most viewers, I'm sure, uh, especially in the Greece area, uh, that name is uh, synonymous with uh, just a, a dirty cop. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Just dirty. Uh, the, the epitome, the example of, uh, of what a rogue, just dirty cop is. He was the one uh, using cocaine and forcing Absolutely. sex yep. on a woman yep. was like six months ago or yep. something, lost his job, and now exactly. he's in the courts. Mm -hmm. um, well... What, how did you come up with this idea then? At what point did you shift? Because you did two documentaries. One was called right. Rochester um, PD Exposed, mm -hmm. and then the other one was Rochester PD Exposed. Dis no, the other one is, uh, I went a little stronger, a little uh, longer with the title. The, uh, the second one, the first was RPD Exposed in 01, and that one went on to gain a lot of uh, national attention uh, in, in media, mostly print media, like the Source magazine uh, picked it up and did a Q&A on me and my work with video. But the second one was, uh, that one actually, RPD Exposed won a Community Impact Award at the uh, ACM Northeast Festival in Boston, right outside Boston, Malden, Massachusetts. And the second show video in 03 was RPD Badges of Dishonor, Corruption, and Murder. Hmm. And that one, uh, the central point of that one was the execution, is what I call a 14-year-old Craig Hurd by two RPD cops, uh, you know, shot uh, twice in the head. Uh, unarmed, um, he was. He had a stolen car, and they could have uh, tried a lot of other measures, like waiting him out. And they basically cornered him in a dead end street off of Park Avenue, and yeah. executed him. Mm -hmm. So, um, was were you going to continue this um, look at the police force and the brutality and abuse that happens within it? Was that something that you? wanted to keep doing or things were just coming up over and over again that uh, made you I think uh, like like any uh, like any creative force you know what I mean whether it's a musician or an artist that paints on canvas or I look at myself as you know having a, a creative side as far as you know uh, putting a story and 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 putting something together on, on a video you know or film aspect I think uh, we all have have it in us you know and the timing was right uh, with issues that were happening. You know, and 01, Vandy Davis was uh, murdered on, on uh, also unarmed, by the way, on, off of Joseph Avenue in the city. And then in 03, Craig Hurd. So I had, I had those two in me, you know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. um, and so those kind of were what they were. I mean, uh, they gained a lot more publicity. A lot of, you know, controversy was stirred up, which, uh, which I welcome because, you know, it, 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 means, it means it touched the nerve. And that's mm -hmm. what I set out to do. Well, we're going to go to break, and during the breaks of this show, we're going to show clips from your documentary so you can get a feeling of Davy V's work, and then maybe you can tell people later where to get these online or how they can see the, the whole documentary. And we'll also continue talking about okay. current issues with police brutality and things that we can do as community members and citizens here to prevent this and to have some um, investigative review board and figure out where to go from here. You're watching Rochester Indie Media's Indie TV. Check us out online, rochester.indymedia.org. Mondays and Thursdays at 6.30, Channel 15. Thanks. That's right. We can't take no more. We're not buying it. Our chief of police is blind and can't understand the video. We're not blind. Our chief of police seems to see, seem to see that he's blind. He cannot see what the video is showing. But you know what, people? We're not blind anymore. We're not deaf and we're not dumb. And we're not blind anymore. So maybe we need to get rid of our chief of police since they can't seem to see what's happening. Every time something comes out, no matter how bad it is, he seems to justify the police in doing it. Now that's the wrong leader as far as I can see. I'm a taxpayer, registered voter. I'm not afraid to open my mouth and say what needs to be said. If we need to get rid of our chief of police, we need to get rid of our chief of police.
Fuck the police. Apparently you can say that only because I found that out because I was filming a demonstration talking about citizen journalism and um, activists were on the corner. This was during a tax day event and a young activist had climbed a tree to put up a sign and uh, the police had asked her to come down. She wasn't coming down right away. They brought in the fire trucks. It was becoming this very um, quickly um, aggressive and escalated, you know, situation on the on the police department side well I think it was stirring some emotion obviously people were very upset because they had pepper sprayed this girl while she was in the tree she could have easily yeah, I think fallen. I recall it. it was a very dangerous situation and the protesters the few of them that had gathered they weren't really even protesting it was just had become like a gathering of some folks and a few people started chanting no justice no peace fuck the police mm -hmm. and uh, were immediately arrested it went into the courts uh, a couple people did take ACDs they didn't know how it would be tied up it, and yeah. um, one um, community member decided to fight it and his charges were dismissed. Uh, and I think these are the kind of things like people don't often know their rights exactly. and they think they're going to be intimidated. They're going to get into court. They're going to say, oh, well, we're going to, you know, hold you on this, but you can actually say that. And I think we can say it on public access because I'm um, fine with it. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, sometimes you, you just got to say it as it is. And yeah, I absolutely. do want to clarify something. Um, that uh, before we were talking in the other segment and we were talking about the, the corruption in Greece with the Greece police and I misspoke and I said it was Nicholas Joseph who had coerced some sexual um, act as well as with the cocaine use, but I want to separate uh, the dishonorable distinctions here and that that was actually Gary Pignato. So I don't yep. know if we want to go over that. I just want to make sure yep. that we're clear on that. People have people been hearing that in the mainstream. No, you're right. I mean, what, what's, what's, what's crazy is this, you know, and I don't know, a lot of viewers out here have children. I have two boys. I have a, a, a baby, a, a girl just born. Uh, and the sad thing here really is that so many kids aspire to be a police officer and it's, it's, a, it's such a proud job, you know what I mean, to help people. And that we even have to discern, uh, like you said, the dishonorable, <laughs> behaviors of, of two people sworn to uphold the law is disgusting, you know. But you're right, Pignato was the one coercing women into sex uh, or basically threatening them with imprisonment. And um, which I'm lost on what part of the I uphold the law part mm -hmm. that is, but right. you know. And uh, Nicholas Joseph was basically the uh, coke head at a bar way past midnight uh, with a family, by the way, uh, at home and uh, slamming into a back of a car, you know what I mean, drunk and high on coke. And uh, so you're right. Caused a pregnant woman. Caused to a pregnant woman to go into premature labor. Yep. Yeah, and, and then fled the, the scene. Needs baby as now. a first responder, and uh, mm -hmm. it's like a doctor. You're always on call, by the way. Fled if the if scene. you're a police officer, you could be at Kmart. You're still a police officer. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah. Flee the scene. Of an the scene. Yep. Pregnant woman who's like the judge the said, Judge uh, uh, Justice uh, Francis Afrani, and I and I took the trial in every day I went. I think I missed one day, and I was there for the sentencing. And basically. Uh, uh, he told them, uh, you're a disgrace, basically, and you fled under the cover of night. So he knew what he was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have amnesia after an injury and make it home 10 miles away. So, mm -hmm. Well, you know, you hear a lot about the few bad apples. You know, well, these are just the bad guys, or this is just, they do a disservice to the whole police department. Is that the case? Is, it, is this a systemic problem with authority and power and really not looking at alternative ways that we could be... Um, uh, dealing with conflicts and you know um, problems within our community. What's what's your take on that? I always try any any uh, any interview I do, whether media or, or television like this. Uh, thanks to you guys, you know, doing a great work by the way at, at indie media. You know, uh, putting putting real stories. You know what I mean? Uh, cable access has such power, and a lot of times, not to name no names, but it's misused. And uh, you guys are, are just an exemplary example of that. So doing a great work and whenever I, I'm, I'm, I have the opportunity to express this I do because I've been labeled it's easy to label somebody one thing and it kind of sticks with you I've been labeled like a cop hating machine and um, 
there is no doubt in my mind that there are good officers out there. There's no doubt in my mind that there are honest, you know, officers. I think it's systemic, this is my opinion, in the sense that it, it falls back to training. It falls back, uh, many times a police officer goes into a situation and instead of doing what I would call a de-escalation, they escalate the mm -hmm. situation. You hear people in the inner city, I grew up in the inner city, and they constantly say, they think twice before they call the police. Because many times calling the police is actually calling in another problem. Mm -hmm. So I believe a lot of it has to do with the training. I believe a, a policeman almost has to be a social worker mm -hmm. with a gun. Mm -hmm. And what I mean is they, they lack this training. They lack the cultural sensitivity. And a lot of them are, are bullies. And they mm -hmm. come in that with that military mentality of kicking ass and mm -hmm. violating people's rights. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just want to say for the record, I mean, I, I don't think they're all bad. But the few bad apple thing, it kind of gets corny. It, it, it kind of gets cliche and played out. Mm -hmm. I think it, it's, it's seeming to be that it's more than a few bad apples. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't, I don't, I'm not pretending to have the answers, but I know that it's deeply rooted. And a, a lot of it I blame on the, on the training and the hiring. And I believe they, they need a lot of psychological screening. Some of these guys are just wackos, mm -hmm. straight up. And, and, and they should never make the force. So I believe a lot of it should be implemented early on in the hiring process, and I don't think it is. Mm -hmm. You know, it's true about not wanting to call 911. I'm like that, you know, our house was broken into, and I'm like, well, there, if I can't get the insurance money, there's no reason, and a couple incidences, strange things happened where there was this troubled teen who almost ran into our car, and he seemed injured, and I didn't, he wouldn't, he, we didn't hit him. I mean, this was a, we just were trying to aid him, making sure he doesn't get hit by a car, because exactly. he had just this erratic behavior, and we didn't want to call the police, so we tried to sit with him and work it out, and we finally realized we were gonna have to call 911 because the situation was severe. And I felt that just in the approach of my conversation with the 911 as I had to de-escalate yeah. the fear, he's not armed, he's okay. Absolutely. Don't hurt him when you come. Because you know don't. what, you know because what to I go wrong. Because I felt that they, out of fear almost, will come in and think he's giving them a, you know, an attitude. They're not gonna try to assess this kid's exactly. psychological makeup. And if we stayed there as community members that were not showing fear as unarmed, you know, um, not suited people that were willing to take this risk, could you just take a different approach? And, and it worked and and I felt good about it but I think maybe we need to do that we need to when we come back let's talk about that like how as community members we can get involved with kind of taking care of our community and de-escalating things and modeling or having some kind of review board or other things set in place that these things are not continuing to happen because we have really high rates and I don't know how it compares do you want to make one last comment about like our rates of police brutality because I know at some point um, we had pretty high statistics. Well, it's funny, I mean, I, and I don't have the statistics offhand to, to shoot the number, but yeah, per capita, I mean, like with New York City. It's funny, because I'm a big animal lover, but going into the whole thing with dogs, there was an article recently in the DNC, how the police here in Rochester shoots dogs five times more than a city of 11 million people. You know what Fear. I mean? So it's, You're afraid of the And end. that's just dogs, imagine that's just humans. dogs, I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was an interesting article. You're watching Rochester Indy Media's Indy TV. We're here with Davey V, an independent citizen journalist. And uh, stay tuned. Check us out online, rochester.indy media. And we'll be back. Address this situation of uh, their slogan, we care. You have to ask yourself about that statement. They have displayed on the building like they really are concerned about this community. But what have they done to show that, show that they're concerned? What have they implemented with this community to make something better or change something about the community? What kind of uh, program or plan have they put in place for this community to show that, hey, we're trying to make a change, we're trying to implement something for this neighborhood or these people? Basically nothing. I mean, most of their money or most of their power is going to downtown, constructing a brand new jail, constructing a brand new uh, office for the chief of police and all these other individuals. If the problem area is the inner city, why is all the money going to building a jail? Why is all the money going to brand new police cars? Why is all the money going to uh, other venues other than strengthening the community? So you have to ask yourself these questions. What's going on inside of Rochester? On May 24, 1988, 30-year-old Calvin Green was shot three times at close range and killed by Rochester Police Officer Gary E. Smith. 
Green, a father of two young children, was unarmed. Less than two weeks later, a grand jury cleared Rochester Police Officer Gary E. Smith of any wrongdoing. On January 4, 2001, 21-year-old Vandy Davis was shot and killed by Rochester Police Officer David Gephardt. Davis was unarmed. Officer David Gephardt said the incident was an accident and that he tripped over an extension cord on the floor of the Joseph Avenue apartment. And as a result of this, his shotgun went off, striking Davis in the chest. No one, including the mayor, William Johnson, the chief of police, Robert Duffy, the district attorney, Howard Rellin, or Officer David Gephardt himself, have ever addressed the question as to why Officer David Gephardt had his finger on the trigger of the shotgun in the first place if he never had any intentions of shooting Davis. Rochester Indie Media is Indie TV. We're here talking with Davey V. Before we continue, you know, you, you um, talked a lot about how important um, public access and doing these types of shows that Indie Media provides and talking and getting out, t talking to people and getting out stories that we often don't hear in the corporate press. And doing that, a lot of people that you don't see working here are. Um, critical members of our indie media community that do a lot of work day in and day out. And I want to recognize these awesome people. We have Ted Forsyth, Susan Galloway, Ben Dean Kawamura, and Andy Dillon um, coming into the studio and producing and filming and editing these shows. So uh, if it wasn't for them, none of this would happen. So thank you guys. and. Uh, thanks for all the work you've done as a citizen journalist, and we want to keep encouraging people to do this, to come in, learn how to use this equipment, produce the shows, and take advantage while they have it. People have lost this access and rights uh, in the west side of Rochester now. We no longer have public access stations for the public that can come in and freely use equipment and learn these skills, so we still have um, these facilities, and you can get your voice out. We want people to take advantage of it. So I, I want to say Absolutely. that. Absolutely. That, that's great. And, and your work I'd just is like really to important. Add, uh, I'd just like to add a little bit that, um, again, when I've done interviews um, in the past, some point or another, the, the interviewee, you know, the person that's interviewed me, would, uh, would ask me, you know, what do I hope to do by my work? And one of the things is to motivate and encourage, especially when it comes to the youth. There's so much talent out there, you know what I mean? And so much wasted talent, you know what I mean? Hanging out and... I, I, just get involved in something you believe in. Get involved in something like public access, you know what I mean? And, and what you guys are doing is, is great. I was recently in a, in a bad accident, which I mm -hmm. want to choose to kind of forget, but I was basically a pedestrian, hit crossing the street, and my recovery has been slow. I have a fracture in my left leg. And uh, as I sit here, um, I, I would not miss, have missed this for the world, excuse mm -hmm. me, you know, and uh, because it's something positive and it just goes to the heart of what, what uh, you know, what public access is, you know what I mean? And in many, in many forms, it's being ignored, it's not being used, it's not being taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. So if I can motivate just one person watching this to get involved in, in something, you know, similar and get a camera and just document injustices, please do so, you know, it's mm -hmm. just, I can't stress that enough. And that's what we like to do. We like to have our viewers feel there's some empowerment factor and things that we can do. We are talking about a lot of issues on the show and especially with police brutality, because I think people have felt that and, um, we people want to know what, what they can do like how can we confront it what, what have you told people like dealing with the brutality and abuse in their communities when they see it happening or how close um, are we if at all or have we talked about these discussions of um, police review boards like a citizen review board and where people these police are being held accountable because it's the rare moment where you see right. an officer like um, you know uh, Nicholas Joseph taken away in handcuffs and exactly. finally someone is paying for the crime that they've committed because normally they, they get off and they don't exactly. face the indictments. I told people it's sad it's going on uh, next month will be 16 years that my dad has passed away and he was uh, one of those thorns in the side of the higher elected officials uh, along with Reverend Graves, who did great work in the community for, for many, many years, for decades, uh, Reverend Raymond Graves. And basically, he would call and call and call out uh, for a civilian review board. And almost, you know, 20 years, 20, 25 years at least, uh, from the time he's passed and also the time that he spent lobbying for this, um, and it's, it, it, we still don't have one, you know. Um, I mean, those are other more, you know, uh, uh, complicated matters. What I tell people is get involved. I can't tell you the amount of calls that I receive weekly 
and people stop me in the street or at a Wegmans or at a Walmart and recognize me and say, man, I got my ass kicked by a cop or what can I do or whatever? And I say, what did you do about it? Well, you know, not much. I mean, well, the police is not going to knock on your door and say, uh, excuse me, I beat your ass last week, so here's how to sue me, you know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. And it's just get involved. You know, yeah. you got to get involved. You got to make it count. You got to document. You got to stand up, you know what I mean? And you got to you got to fight for really what you believe in, you know, but it's unfortunately we're, we, bec we uh, become complacent mm -hmm. and it's so much easier to kind of look the other way or well, it didn't affect me. Mm -hmm. It didn't hit home, mm -hmm. but it can hit home. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, and, and very often, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, it does, you know, yeah, you shouldn't and wait till it gets to that to act, you know. And more and more now there's um, these, um, well, random supposedly stops, but it's over on the side of the city where I live in the 19th Ward and um, um, by um, Chai Lai over there. Mm -hmm. And it's really not, it's not random, it's profiling, it's targeting a lot of people of color, a lot of African American members in the community. And so we see that the system is also very racist. Can you make comments about that? I mean, the, who's like really being abused in the system and the impact it's having? Absolutely, I mean, I, mean, I, I believe like with Mayor Duffy in the city of Rochester, I believe, I believe he means good. I mean, I, I believe he does. But the thing that we forget is that one man cannot oversee or change or, you know, be there at every move for a police force like in Rochester of 750 plus officers. Chief Moore, I want to believe, I don't know him personally, I want to believe he means good. But I, I fear that based of the very existent circumstances like the racial profiling, you know, which is, which is always there and it never goes away, no matter how much they try to discount it. And the stereotyping, you know, like with the whole project impact, there's no doubt that there's crime in the city. There's no doubt about it. I mean, I'm a father of, of two young boys and a, and, a, and, a, and a baby girl. But at the same time, it'd be sad to see, and I know it's happening where, you know, the wrong people are being targeted, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you walk with your, you know, your pants sagging or, you know, you got the hip hop look, you know what I mean? And, and it's sad because that should not, you know, subject somebody to, to that treatment, you know. So my fear is that through the cracks, a lot of stuff is getting away. And it's basically like a, like a war zone is in the mind of the police officers. Like basically not stopping to, to, you know, discern, you know, this person from that person. And it's sad. I mean, and, and, and um, as a community, we got to work, you know what I mean, together. Uh, I, I still believe it's people getting involved, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Um, and people making a difference, you know. And that's what we want to see happen. We want people to get involved. Call us or contact us via rochester.indymedia.org because we want to hear your stories, your ideas of working on specifically this issue because we want to mitigate the suffering and the violence that's happening in the, in the city. And if you have ideas, come forward, come on the show, write articles, uh, get involved, Absolutely. like Davey's saying. And thank you so much for coming on thank and you for talking to us. And you'll get some clips of Davey Davy's work. Is there another way that people can see the full? They can reach me by uh, they can reach me by email, and I mean I could uh, I could uh, work out where where okay. they could receive a, a DVD uh, copy. Okay. So if you want to see the copies yeah. of of his documentaries, all right. Thank yeah. you. This has been Rochester Indie Media, um, and again Mondays and Thursdays at 6:30. Stay tuned. <laughs>